We are in the new month, it's the fourth month of the Hebrew Israelite biblical year. It is the third day of the fourth month of the Hebrew Israelite year, but it's the 15th day of June, according to the pagans. It is a Sabbath. So we say welcome, everybody. Welcome and happy Sabbath. The Sabbath has fully come, and I'm hoping that you're enjoying the Sabbath rest and the Sabbath blessing because the Lord said that we should keep his Sabbath as a sign and a memorial between him and us. And the him is Yahweh and the us is Israel. The scripture says, between me and you. That's what Yahweh says. And the me is Yahweh and the you is Israel. And no one else, you know, the scripture says that the Lord gave the Sabbath to Israel and he did not give it to any other nations. And in the Psalm, it says that the Lord make his will known unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgment unto Israel. Right? And for the others, he did not make it known unto them. All praises to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. All right. Um, yes. Yes. Go ahead. No, I said, so it is written. So it is written, so my brother. So it is written and so it shall be. Yes. Yes. And we have returned and have repented. And we're seeking the Lord every single day. You know, reading the scriptures, studying the word, getting together like this. We're all searching for the truth. And the search continues, family. And today we're going we're gonna to continue also. You know, I, you know, our family, I tell you what, my spirit has been on edge, if that's the way to put it. Since, in fact, since I've started talking about the Ethiopia doctrine, the Carbonagas, the Davidic bloodline, this thing with, with Brother um, Malik Jediah, the whole thing. And it's just, it's just, it's just growing heavier and heavier each time. And I'm beginning to see this picture clearer and clearer every day. And I do believe, I do believe that these um, camps, even though I don't know if I can say, I'm not going to say camps, I'm going to say these different ministries in the Hebrew Israelite awakening, they have been subverted. And there is, and the enemy is behind it. I believe that there is an organized effort, a true organized effort. I don't think that this is happening generically. I don't believe it is happening randomly. I believe it is targeted. And they are pushing this thing for a reason. And the reason is that if they can divert us from the land, then they can further our affliction. And we have to be very vigilant, family. Be very vigilant. Be very conversant with this and do not get overthrown. And also be willing to point people away from it. And this is the reason I said, we are here to break the to break down the strongholds, not only not only of Christianity, but also the strongholds that are here in Israel. And this is one of the main ones, I believe. This and the moon doctrine. These are, these are the main two. And this one especially seems to be um, moving like. It's moving like wildfire amongst Israel, especially those that are just awakened. And, and um, it, it really bothers my spirit every day, day and night. I have been thinking about it. Go ahead, Ophelia. Okay. What I wanted to know is when the debate comes together and all the dates are planned, will it be on your platform on one of the nights, uh, Friday night or Saturday, or will it be uh, 
any other time during the week? And if so, how will we know? Yeah, no, so we, I will announce it. Of- yeah, I will announce it. They say though, they they had said, I believe in um, to Sister Contrail that it could be a Saturday or a Sunday, I think they say. Mm. Um, let me see. Let me see if I, I think it says here. And I still have it up, by the way. So let's see. I guess Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, okay. yeah. This says pick a Saturday or Sunday. Here it is. Pick a Saturday or Sunday, not this weekend. So this weekend is out. So we can pick a Saturday or Sunday. And I'm hoping that we can pick a Saturday at this same time when we would meet. Yay. What is this about, Brother Judah? What is this about? Mm-hmm. Brother Tio Ministries are um challenge us, uh, sent out a challenge to us to debate whether whether Ethiopia is is where the new Jer- is where the true Jerusalem is mm-hmm. they believe they believe that Ethiopia is the true Jerusalem and of course you know we teach against that and so sister Contrail um had shared our video with them on their platform and and um and then this this exchange took place so they want a debate between us to um to put the matter to rest. So we will see. All right, family, we're gonna read a scripture. We're gonna say a prayer. I'm gonna talk a little bit for a few more minutes. Um, and then I hope that it'll be edifying. So give me today the challenge. Today is a challenge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, family, let's let's read. I don't know whether my readers are here still. Um, but we are going to read Matthew. We're going to start with Matthew, the seventh chapter. And we, we will read from verse, verse seven, verses seven through to uh, 12. Ask and it shall be given. You seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that Asketh, receiveth, and that and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom is his son ask bread? Will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them? And that ask him. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. All praises, honor, and glory to the Heavenly Father, whose name is Yahweh, and the Son, who, whose name is Yahweh Shai. Father, we ask for your spirit. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your blessings. We ask for a Sabbath day's rest. We ask for edification. We ask also for healing to the members of this platform and the people who are present here and those who are absent. Remember a dear sister that asked us for prayer, Lord. Be with her, bless her. Send your healing spirit upon her and restore her. Grant us eternal life establish your kingdom and save us so your name alone will be glorified in all the earth is our prayer in the name of Yahweh Shai, our Savior. And for that, let the house say, so let it be. So So let let it be, be, family. So let it be. All right. A couple of things in the chat. Okay, I will... I will get back to those later. So the focus, the focus today is on verse verses uh, seven, sorry, verses nine, ten, and eleven. That's the focus. This is Yahweh Shai speaking. And, and he says, Or what man is there of you? And he's talking about us, the, the, the Hebrew Israelites, whom, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone. 
or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. Then Yahawashai went on to say that if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? There's also the precept to this, which I'm going to read in Matthew chapter, sorry, in Luke. The precept is in Luke, the 11th chapter. I'm going to read verses uh, 9 down. It says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knock, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will, him, will, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? It is clear here that Yahweh Shai is saying that as a good father is, as a good man is to his children, that's how the heavenly Father is to his people. So Yahweh is comparing a good father to the Heavenly Father. He did not say, as the Heavenly Father is, so is the good father on earth. He says, as the good father on earth is, so is the Heavenly Father. And I find that very interesting, that he would, that he would say such a thing. Because the scripture says that our Father in heaven, remember, Yahweh Shai said, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. And this is how the Heavenly Father is. And he also confer upon us and upon the, the man these same attributes. Now, not only is he our Heavenly Father, but he is also our husband. And, and I find here in Jeremiah, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 31, and this is where we have the new, new covenant promise. And the Lord says, this is Yahweh speaking. Yahweh is speaking. And he says he's going to make a new covenant with us. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. And here is the sentence, although I was an husband unto them, says Yahweh. That phrase, although I was an husband unto them. So not only is he our Heavenly Father, but he is also an husband to us. And in another scripture, he says, I am married, I am married unto you. So it would seem to me, therefore, that the, that the same powers and attributes of the Father can also be found in the husband. which powers were conferred upon him by Yahweh, because that's how Yahweh is. Now we're speaking about a good husband and a good father. I'm not talking, remember, whenever we have these discussions, we're not talking about the bomb. 
We're not talking about the no good. We're talking about the man of the Lord, the father that is that has the spirit and is following the heavenly father. That's the man that we're talking about. That's the, that's the husband that we're talking about. So this is a continuation of what we did a few weeks ago concerning the relationships, concerning the family. And I'm going to say that this is um, a soft version of it. So I want to take us to uh, Numbers, the 30th chapter. And we're going to talk about laws. Now, remember we said that the laws are a part of our, uh, a feature of our, um, our channel, our platform, the laws, because we want Israel to know what the laws are. So here we're talking about some laws concerning vows. And verse 1 says, And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which Yahweh has commanded. If a man vow a vow unto Yahweh, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. This is where we get the term, a man's word. A man's word. He shall do according to all that proceeded out of his mouth. The Lord is going to hold a man accountable if he makes a vow unto the Lord and swears by it. Verse 3, though. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth. So this is a young lady who is in her father's house. And she makes a vow. She promised something to someone or that she will do something. Verse 4 says, And if her father hear her vow and her bond wherewith she has bound her soul and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand. And every bond wherewith she has bound her soul shall stand. She made a promise. Her father hears it. He says nothing. He holds his peace. She must carry it out. Why? Because the scripture says that if a man vow a vow or swear, he must carry it out. So the woman is the same. She, she makes a vow. Her father hears it and he says nothing. She's bound by the vow that she made. Verse 5. But if her father disallowed her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds wherewith she has bound her soul shall stand. Now, this is the power that the Lord confers upon the, the father. And remember, the scripture says, as the father is, so is Yahweh. So now, what's going to happen here? Her father says, you're not doing that. But, but remember, Yahweh says, if you make a vow, you must carry it out. But the father says, no, you're not going to do that. Then what's going to happen? And Yahweh shall forgive her. Why? Because her father disallowed her. Because she's free from it. Because she's free from it. Yeah. She's free from it. Yeah. His, his yes. choice, man's choice that it lead his household. Yes, thank you. And Yahweh concurs with the man, with the father. Yahweh concurs with the father. All right. Now, if she had at all an husband. So you're going to see how this is the reason, family, why, and, and this is why I keep saying, you know, that the, that the, in our, in our kingdom, no, there's not going to be any single woman who left her father's house and be out there on her, on, on her, on her own. It's not going to happen. 
because and 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 you should not leave the cover of a man and you should not um well well let, let, let me continue because you're going to see it but but you but you have to have the cover of a man and by the way you know this is the reason why the scripture says that seven women are going to take hold of one man because because as we wake up to going back to these laws we're going to understand why it is important to have a man to cover you All right, it goes on to say in verse 6 um, that if she had at all an husband when she vowed or utterly, uh, sorry, or uttered out, out of her lips wherewith she bound her soul and her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then her vows shall stand and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. So if this lady has a husband, the same apply as if it were her in her father's house. Now, do you know that this is also the reason why a man gives his daughter to the husband? Because he is placing her under the same protection. Um, protection. Thank you protection he's taking his daughter and he's placing her under that protection why because the father the father in verse 5 and the husband in verse 7 have the exact same power watch verse 8 but if her husband disallows her on the day that he heard it now the husband is doing exactly the same thing as the father here in verse 5 if the father disallow her now here the husband has the same power. But if the husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow which she vowed, and that which she uttered out of her, her early, where which she bound her soul of none effect. And what's going to happen? And Yahweh will concur. And the Lord Yahweh shall forgive her. Because her husband says no. So as the father is, so is the Lord. And as the husband is, so is the Lord. Verse 9. But if every vow of a widow, no, watch this. But if every, but every vow of a widow, or of her that is divorced. And you know they say, oh, you can't divorce. Wrong. How many times are we going to see divorce in the law? If she is a widow, that means her husband dies. She's released from the law of her husband if he's dead. And if she's divorced, the same thing. She's released from the covenant. Where we... They have bound their soul, shall stand against her. The widow, the widow's vow shall stand against her. And the divorced woman's vow shall stand against her. She's on her own. And if she vowed in her father's house, who is, who is the she that is talking about? The subject matter is in the previous verse. Either the widow, her husband dies, she goes back home. Or she's divorced and she goes back home. And if she vows it in her husband's house or bound her soul by a bond with an oath and her husband hears it and held his peace at her and disallowed her not, then all her vows shall stand and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband has utterly made them void on the day that he heard them, then whatsoever proceeded out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the bond of her soul shall not stand. Her husband has made them void. 
and Yahweh has forgiven her. Yahweh has concurred with the husband. So, verse 13, every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul. By the way, what is this? What is, what is this oath to afflict your soul? Her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void. Now, let us find out what is this afflicting of the soul. Right. Let me take a huh? the Lord. So we must have click our soul. We must fast. Okay. Thank you so much. Who is that? Who is that? Whoever that is, that sister knows what we're talking about. Leviticus 23, verse 27. I'm going to show you. Also on the 10th day of the seventh month, which day is this? The day of atonement. You shall, it shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict, afflict your soul. And offer an offering made by fire unto you. You shall afflict your soul on the day of atonement. And by the way, we're going to be talking about that when our fall feasts are, are approaching, okay? You shall afflict your soul. So what is this afflicting of the soul? Let's find out. Let's go to Psalm 109, because I did say I'm going, to, I'm going to bring this out in a lesson. Psalm 109 and verse 24. Verse 24. It says, my knees are weak through what? Fasting. And my flesh faint, uh, sorry, faileth of fatness. Let's go to Isaiah. Take a few witnesses to prove this. Isaiah 58. And verse 5. The Lord is saying, Is it such a fast that I have chosen? Or a day for a man to afflict his soul? What do you think he's talking about? The day of atonement. So, the fast is the afflicting of the soul. So when we go back here to Numbers 30, and we are at verse 9. Sorry, no, we are at verse 13. It says, And every vow and every binding oath to afflict your soul her husband may establish it or may make it void. That means the woman says, I'm going to fast. And the woman says, no, no fasting this week. No fasting this week. And the husband can make it void. Now, you know that this has a certain other implication to the relationship. And I'm going to show you um, that this law still stands. We're going to go to New Testament, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And this is the teaching on marriage. This is the teaching on marriage. We're going to go read verses 4 and 5. Now, we can start from the beginning. It says, Now concerning the things where we wrote, you wrote on, unto me, it is good for a man not, man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. And what is fornication? The sins of fornication that we read, okay? All right. Let every man have his own wife and every woman her own, or her own husband. That means the wife should only go to her husband and the husband should only go to his wife. Not one. Any number of wives because own doesn't mean one. Own means your own, whichever woman is yours. And more than one of them, according to the law, right? Okay. Let the, but, but it doesn't apply both ways. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto her husband. What is this talking about? The wife has no power of her own body but the husband. So Y'all? Sister, sister, hold your peace, please. <laughs> hold your peace, sister. The wife has no power of her own body, 
but the husband. And likewise, also the husband has no power of his own body, but the wife. You ever hear people say, oh, it's my body, I can do what I want. Not, with your, not when you're married, not when you have a husband. You, you own me, I own you. Verse 5, be fraud not one the other. What does this mean? Don't withhold, okay? And I'm not going to be explicit. We have young ones here. Do not def defraud one the other, except it is with consent for a time. What are you talking about, Paul? That you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. You know that this is the law that we just read. That Paul is saying that you have to consent to fasting or prayer. Otherwise, it is illegal and unlawful to defraud one the other. Why? Because y'all don't have power over your own bodies. That you may come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So Paul is affirming this law in Numbers 30. And you can't say, I'm fasting for two weeks. You can't say that because your husband can say, no, he ain't. Verse 14. But if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from, the, from day to day, then he established all her vows or all her bonds which are upon her. He confirmeth them because he held his peace at her in the day that he heard it. Husband say, I'm not saying anything. Or the father say, I'm going to leave it. Let her live by her words. Verse 15. But if but he, if he shall anyways make them void, after that he heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. What does this mean? He heard it. He says nothing. It says from day to day. He heard the thing the whole time. Time passes. He says nothing. Then when time came, he said, oh, by the way, I don't want you to do that. The, the Lord says, then he's going to have to bear her iniquity. Now, does the Lord forgive her here? Yeah, but her iniquity is now upon him and he has to bear it. The Lord, you realize that here the Lord did not concur to this. What the Lord is saying is that you can't hear this thing for, for two weeks. And you know that the time is coming up when she made the vow that she has to fulfill. And then at last minute, you decide to change your mind. The Lord said, if you do that, you're going to bear her iniquity. You're the man. And the Lord did not concur. So now her sin is upon him. Verse 16. These are the statutes which Yahweh commanded Moses between a man and his wife. And between a daughter and her father, or father and her daughter, being yet in her youth in her father's house. These are the laws. And this is why we say that what we have today in Babylon, where a, a girl grows up, she's 18, she finishes college, she rents an apartment and she's a single woman. And then she's out there making um, vows. Not going to happen in the kingdom. She's not going to leave her father's protection. As thus saith the law. Now I know the Christian church likes to say, you know, that Jesus died and put an end to the law. Can you show me how Jesus put an end to this year? Can somebody... Explain to me how Jesus' death on the cross put an end to this. It does not. It does not. And when we say that in the land of our captivity, that we're going to be think ourselves, 
And we're going to turn back to the Heavenly Father to keep in all his laws, statutes, and commandments, all his laws, statutes, and commandments, which I've commanded you this day. This is what we're talking about. And when brethren said to me, what are the laws that we're supposed to keep? Write down in your book, Deuteronomy, sorry, Numbers 30, from 1 through to 16. And remember it. No, this, this is not just for the women. This is for the men too, brothers. Brothers, this is for us. Because there's a huge implication in verse 15. Where it says that if he hears it and then he changes his mind at the last minute, her iniquity is upon him. And the scripture says, only a Hawashai can bear another man's sin. Brothers, you think you can bear the sin of your daughter or your wife? This is a huge implication for the man. So we have to act according to the spirit. Who is the we? Men. I'm talking about men. Brothers. This is not no you over, overruling your wife whenever you feel like it. And playing with her emotions and telling her yesterday and no tomorrow. Or yesterday when you're happy and no tomorrow when you're, when you're upset about the same thing. Because then you're going to have to bear her sin. And the scripture says you can't bear it. You cannot bear it. And that's the reason the Lord says this here. And he did not concur. So let us bear that in mind, family. Let us bear that in mind. Now, I also want to add one other thing to this before we shut it down. One other thing. <clears throat> this is something that we spoke about um, before, but I did not make that this comparison. So I'm going to make this comparison now. It is... Or maybe I did, but I'm going to include it here. Deuteronomy 22 and verses 28. Let's go down to it, 28 and 29. It says that if a man find a damsel, which is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and he take hold of her and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he has humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. Now, we talk about this because um, we, when we were discussing what fornication is. Now, this is to unmarried people. A damsel that is a virgin that is not betrothed. And a man takes her and lies with her. Now, this is to unmarried people, right? Well, the, the scripture never said they committed any fornication. It says that now that he's done that, she is his wife. They never had to go down to the, the, the temple and offer a ram or a he-goat for the sin of fornication. Because there is no fornication. He now takes her and she's his wife. But let's go back to what we just talked about. The father's power. Exodus 22 and verse 16. The, fa the father's power over the same situation. If a man entice a maid that is not betrothed, same girl, virgin, not betrothed, and lie with her, he shall surely endure, or endure her to be his wife. Same thing. You find a single girl, you like each other, you go and knock boots. There's no fornication. There's no let them go down to the priest and confess their fornication. Or let us take them out to the gate and stone them. There's no such thing. There's no sin. No sin occurred right here. The scripture said he must be her wife. She must be his wife. He must be her husband. Don't put her away all his days. But here's what the father came in and did. The power of the father. If her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay the money according to the dowry of virgins. What is that? 50 shekels of silver. We just read it. 
and the father kicks him out of the house. You're not, you're not going to be my son-in-law. You are no good. You are no good. This is the power of the father. What did the father just do? Nullify this marriage? The father nullifies it. There's no, oh, she needs to go down to the, to the priest and offer a turtle dove for her fornication. There's no such thing because there is no fornication. There's no fornication. There's no place anywhere in the scriptures where two unmarried people commit any fornication. Fornication is committed if you break any of the sins of fornication. What are those sins? Having somebody else's wife, having near kin relationships as listed in the law, man to man, woman to woman, man to animals, or having the or worshiping another god beside Yahweh. Those are the sins of fornication. And with those sins come penalties in the law. But there's no two unmarried people committing any fornication. And brother, uh, I can't say your name. Uh, forgive me. Uh, South Africa. Go ahead, please. <laughs> go, go ahead. Forgive me. I'll learn it one day. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Yeah. Um, the other verse um, that's also speaking to this part, where right, it says, if a man entice a maid, right? Not this one. It says, and they be found. Yeah, this is not, 20, this, uh, not this one. Now, Deuteronomy 22. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, you know, it's, it's funny how that both both are in the, in the 22nd chapter of these books. But anyway, go ahead, go ahead, brother. Sorry. Because now I'm like, okay, what does if they be found mean? That okay, so they they're doing this in secret, you know. They're meeting in the in the meeting at some place, and they're continuously doing this in secret. Nobody knows, and then they're found out. Somebody from the church says, "Hey, I saw your daughter over there with this guy," and they be found out. And by the way, do you know that they them being found out um, can only occur when there are two or more witnesses to it. Now, in today's in today's in today's world, people may take a picture of them or something like that, even though they can deny it and say we were just walking by. But, but in the law, it says that you cannot accuse somebody unless there's two witnesses. So them being found out means that they are going over to um, the 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 Red Roof Inn uh, on different occasions, and then they are found out. Because, because two witnesses saw them. And the two witnesses brought this to the, to the gates and say, we know that these two are doing this. Then the, then the elders of the gates would call him, the man, and the girl together and say, we understand that you are doing this. And we have these witnesses. And they say, yeah. Okay. And, they, and they said, okay, then you have to give the, her father the price of a, of a virgin. And she's your wife forever. Oh, okay. Now I get it because it's it uh, the your explanation expounds on the fact that the whole community of Israel is always watching out to protect uh, their fellow brethren from committing sin. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And the scripture says, "This is how you keep the land from sinning." Yeah, that's protection for us as women and yeah. and, and respect. For, for family. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, Cleveland says, so So Adam allows Eve's bow to stand. Um, I guess so. I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about, though, but, but yeah. Um, let's see what else. Somebody says, what happens, this is Amanda, what happens in the resurrection of the dead? 
in the resurrection from the dead. Um, um, when when the dead husbands and the wives of the spouse still living are remarried. Uh, I don't know who said that they're going to remarry. I don't know who said. That's Amanda. Oh, Amanda. Amanda. So if someone is our right, if, if if my husband dies, I remarry, and then in uh, in the resurrection, we all alive. So. <laughs> yeah, but remember, remember yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. It, it does not work that way. It, do, remember, it doesn't work that way. It, it doesn't work that way. Remember, you are only married as long as you're alive. Once you're dead, that, that marriage is over. You're in the in the resurrection. He's not your wife. He's not your husband. Luke and 20, yeah. 27 to 40. Exactly. No, repeat what you said. In the resurrection, what happened? In the resurrection, you know, it's not your wife. Okay. And not your husband. Read, read, read Luke 20, 27 to 40. It'll tell yeah. you exactly what you're asking. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Hawa is the is the um is the god of the living. Once you're dead, it's over with. Uh Brother Simeon, go ahead. I have a question regarding that, but okay. in a different way. Okay. Would the same apply to like your children? If you're like if you have children and then you both end up dying, are they still your children in the afterlife or they're in yeah. the resurrection? Yes. Yeah. Because because till death do us part does not apply to the relationship of of uh, sons and daughters, siblings, huh? Or children? Yeah. That that does not apply. Only in marriage, a person is your is your child, and you are the parent forever. Forever. The so death doesn't end that bond. Um, you, mean, you mean while you're still alive, it that does end that bond, or or when you're or, or when you're dead, you're still your parent. Yes, but in the but, resurrection, but, is that is that still so? You're still or? your parent in the resurrection. Yes, yes, yes. yeah. Well, can but, I say but, something? Yeah. Yes, go ahead, brother. Yeshua is our teacher in all that. So whatever happened with him, will happen to us. When he died, he was still God's son. There and you he go. He rose again. He was still his son. There you go. That's fire, brother. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Sister, Sister Opa, go ahead. Yes, Simeon, I'm still going to be your mom. I think that's why you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going to be your mom. Till death do us part. I'm forever. He's like, he's like oh, no. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> that was so cute. When he asked, asked that, I was like, I know exactly. Yes, I'm still going to be your mom. I love he's you, like, bye. Oh. He's like, oh, no, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was sweet. That was sweet. <laughs> All right. Okay. Awesome. This is why I love this fellowship so much. I love this fellowship. All right. Well, family, uh, if there are no more questions, this is pretty much it. You know, I was I just wanted us to go back to the laws and, and to understand. And remember, we are going to continue to to do the laws because it's also part of feature of this uh, platform, so that uh, so that we can have a proper understanding as to so we can have a proper understanding as to what is required of us now that we are awake. I'm slowing it down because I want to make sure that everybody understands. Go ahead, Brother um, brother Okera. And um, I think I might be able to take one more and then I have to shut it down and I have to run, family. Yeah. Hey, Brother Judah, I was reading, yeah. I went back over um, Exodus again and I just started um, in the Levit um, Leviticus 2 and yeah, he told um, Moses to tell the children of Israel that they shouldn't drink any wine or fermented drink or they shouldn't eat fat or blood throughout their generations. It's a start with forever through the generations. Is it is it correct, right? The, the children of Israel? No. No. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I read it in, um, in Exodus and also I think in the beginning of Leviticus. No. 
Um, yeah, you, may have to, you may have to tell me the, the the where you find that. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me let me read it one more time. It says, hold on. It said um. Hmm. It says, hold on one second. Let me just um. One second. Yeah. It says Adonai Yahoo spoke to Aaron saying, "Do not drink wine or former men drink." Neither, neither you nor your sons with you, when yeah. you go into the when you go into the tent of meeting, so that yeah. you do not die. This is to be a statute yeah. forever throughout your generations. Yeah. 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 Like, like, yeah. yeah there you go. Some, somebody can you, go ahead and somebody can uh, break that down for me. Go ahead. Anybody. That is a specific thing only for those going into the temple, into the yeah. holy of holies, and no yeah. other time. Yeah. Oh, As a matter of fact, okay. there there are other times when he does say wine is good for the body, good for the stomach, and there are at least eight or so scriptures that speak to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 What yeah. about so the this... fact he said he said you shouldn't eat fat and blood short short the generations forever? Like the fat belongs to to Yah to the, you know? Yeah. To the sacrifice. Yeah. So that's why when yeah. I buy when I buy goat or anything or beef, I cut off the fat, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> no, yeah, yes, yeah, brother, yeah, and I'm and I'm aware of that. No, I don't. Uh, we can look at that again another time, but I think that that does not apply to us. I think it applies to the priests. The Levitical priests, yes, it's exactly. the Levitical only. priests, yeah, only. Oh, I, okay. Yeah, I've heard people say, you know, they don't eat the fat, but yeah. if you're not talking about the people, it says that you should not that the the you remember, in the context, it's talking about the priest's duties and the laws concerning the priest. And it's oh, and okay. um, so what you talk about there is, talk, is by the way, what you what you spoke about only applies to Aaron and his sons because they are the high priests. Oh, it doesn't, yeah, oh, it does it. not apply okay. to every Levite. That's that's the first thing, right? Because right. remember, yeah, the high priesthood are are the Aaronites from the from the lineage of of Aaron only. They are the only ones that can be high priests. Yes. Yeah, the other priests, see. yeah, the other mm -hmm. priests from the tribe of Levi um, are different. Hmm. So, yeah, so there are certain special rules that apply to the high priests of the house of Aaron that yeah. do not apply to the other priests who are of the tribe of Levi. Oh, so that, so they had a serious duty, Aaron and yes, his sons. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, yes. I, I even read. I even read also that that I think um, I think it's like two of Aaron's sons they took uh, the censer and put incense and yeah, how I killed them. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, Edab and Abihu, the Aaron's two sons, they died. Yeah, listen, Edab people, and Abihu, they died. That's what people. The, the Christian church also go about oh, Yahawa, he's sweet and nice. Yeah, he is, but when he said to do something and you do the opposite, he will he will destroy you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He destroyed Aaron two sons because of the of the incense, right? Because they yeah. put the incense. Wow, that train fire to I the read, altar. I yeah. read that. I read that. I was shocked when I read it. I was like, "Oh my goodness, this is serious." Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. This is serious, brother Judah. Yes, go ahead. I sent you an email yesterday regarding two Thessalonians two eleven. Um, I would prefer you to look at it first, unless you know exactly what I'm speaking about. Yeah, but um, we we have a misconception. Most people have a misconception when God said, "I will send you a strong delusion." That the translation is incorrect, which is actually a working delusion. What is it actually? A working, a working delusion. Oh, a working delusion. Yes. Okay. Um, I I sent you the a, a screenshot of the. The verse in the Bible in the Greek, mm -hmm. it is basically so. What what a lot of people believe is that when they say God will send you a strong delusion, it means that He will make you believe a lie. But that is incorrect. What it is saying is that He will cause you to believe what you believe, even though you're being told differently. Okay. Yeah, I I can accept that. Yeah. Yep, that's accurate. Yeah, really accurate. Yeah, yeah. No, no, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I accept that. Yeah. Um, and also though, there is the other part to that where where the Lord said that 
I, the Lord, it says that if a prophet is deceived, then I, the Lord, have deceived him. Yes. There's yet another scripture to that. But what, yeah, but what you said concerning um, this script verse is accurate, very accurate. Yes, yes, and I know a lot of people use that other verse to claim that this one is so. But yeah, you know, when you look at the context, which is incorrect. Yeah, I know. Yeah, very, very good, very good, my brother, very good. And I'll take a look at your email also. Yeah, it it just explaining what I just said because yeah. I, I didn't really want to bring it up last night because I know many times when I do this to people I deal with, it it becomes a very harsh situation because yeah. they want to believe the lie and unfortunately you know when you've been taught a lie all your life you end up uh -huh. fighting for that lie as if one question i've been listening to a couple of um other platforms talking about the dietary laws yeah. and one question about the chicken yeah. um <laughs> is it lawful for the chicken to be eaten yes it is lawful okay but the they're saying is... it's not yeah, and, and the question is, um, so my question to them who say it's not, why why is it not? And, and the they question, say because it, it, go eats ahead. Its, it, it, it eats its own feces and, or eat anything that they, you know, can find out in the grass or yard or wherever they are. Yeah. But that's something that people are making up, though. They are deciding what the diet of the animal should be. The, to be to determine whether it's uh it's, it's clean or unclean. Now Yahweh never okay. said yeah Yahweh never said that the unclean animals are unclean because of what they eat. Exactly. And the duck as well. No, the duck is unclean. Okay, they said that as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but not because of what it eats. Not because of what it eats, because Yahweh said the duck is unclean. But the but the chicken was never mentioned as an unclean animal. I know, I never saw it in the right. scripture. Right, so so these people are deciding, they're putting themselves in the place of Yahweh, are uh, deciding that the chicken is unclean because of what it eats. But mm -hmm. animals are not unclean because of what they eat. Why? Because the camel, for example, eats grass. Right. So why, why is he unclean? Because Yahweh said he is in the category of unclean animal. Yeah, but chicken is fine. Chicken is fine. Well, and we're also going to, you know, we we read the law, but we haven't gone through it in details. And, and we need to do that. We're going to go through the Levitical, uh, Levit Leviticus 11 laws concerning unclean foods. We're going to go through it in details. We're going to do a few classes on it to establish what the unclean animals are and be able mm -hmm. to know them visually, because we, we, we really don't know them visually, like the yeah. coney and the air or the um, or the cockatrice. So who, what is that? So we're going to go through these things. We're going to have them visually on the screen so we can know what they are and um, and be aware of, of what these are, and especially some of the fish foods too. If you yes. go to the fish market, you want to be able to look at that fish and say that's unclean. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to do those lessons also. Thank you so much for that, sister. I'm going Thank to take. You. The, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm going to take the brother from South Africa. I am now at five o'clock, family, and this is it. This is the last one. I have to. I have to end it here. Go ahead, brother. But it's a quick one. I just wanted to have her ask them: Have they seen the chicken eating its own poop? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> does not happen. I've lived around no, chickens. I know, it does no, not no, happen. No. No, because we have they, poop. They, and, must and always... they must prove it. I want to <laughs> yeah. see it. <laughs> yes, yes. You are, we always have to wash the poop out the the coop, right? Otherwise, the, we would not have any, any. We would not have that chore if that were true. Now, what I do know though is that sometimes the chicken will will um, excrete, let's say, a whole corn kernel, and he will turn around and pick it right back up out of the poop because it's a whole kernel of corn. But he's not eating his own food. Mm -hmm. it, that's not what. Yeah, that's not what he's doing. And very rarely do you see that. Yeah, no, because its its stomach is too acidic. It, that's why if it poops, it poops sort of like a. It basically doesn't poop. It pees the effluent yes. out. Yeah, yeah. And then it hardens into the poop. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm with that family. I have to, I have to shut it down here. Um, thank you so much again. Thank you for being with us. This is always a pleasure for me to be here with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support. Remember to continue um, to share the message, especially this thing about the, um, the, the cushy item, the, the, the cush doctrine, right? We have to stand up against it and pull, pull Israel out of the fire. I was at all honor, all praises, and all glory to the Heavenly Father, whose name is Yahweh, and His Son, whose name is Yahweh Shai. And again, we lift up Sister Diane in prayer. Shalom, yes. family. Shalom, shalom, and shalom. 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 shalom.